growth is good. That is a basic economic assumption shared the world over. But is it always true? Is it possible or desirable for the new giants of the world economy, China and India, to grow their economies until they've reached American levels of consumption? Well, today I'm joined by Chandra Nair, founder of the Global Institute for Tomorrow, and Raghuram Rajan, former IMF economist and now an advisor to the Indian Prime Minister. Will free market capitalism make or break Asia? Chandran Nair and Raghuram Rajan in Chicago. Welcome both of you, you. to Hard Talk. And Chandran Nair, let me start with you. Seems to me you have developed ideas about Asia's economic future which are based on profound pessimism, a feeling that it's too late for Asia to enjoy the sort of prosperity derived from free market capitalism that we've seen in the West. Well, I actually make it very clear in the book that uh, I'm not pessimist. Like, I'm just asking for us in Asia to take a hard look at where we're going. And that means uh, beginning to recognize that if we aspire to live uh, like Americans, uh, the outcomes are likely to be very catastrophic. So in the book, I essentially try to do a couple of things. And it, it is to mainstream the notion that there must be limits, uh, a, a discussion which typically, if you have in business and political circles, uh, makes you an instant pariah. So I'm glad that the BBC at least has allowed me to come and have well, that discussion. Well, okay, but I come back to the word pessimism. I mean, already you've talked to me about limits, limits to the aspirations perhaps that uh, citizens in India or China should have about their material uh, status. And I just want to put that thought straight away to Raghu Rajan in, in Chicago. Do you accept the notion that in India, in China, people are going to have to accept that they can't have ambitions to live, quote-unquote, an American lifestyle? Well, I, I think the real question is whether everyone in the world can aspire to the kind of living standards that we have in suburban America today. And my sense is, given today's technology, that is uh, probably not sustainable for the world. The real question then comes, who should make the adjustment, and uh, when, and how? And I think the devil is in all those details. I mean, it's not clear to me that it's better for Asia to uh, constrain its aspirations than for, say, the United States, uh, the double-income couple in a 10,000-square-feet house, to cut back on their consumption. So we need to think about where uh, you know, the benefits would be greatest in increasing consumption, where, where the costs of reducing it would be the highest. And of course, over time, technology will allow all of us to consume more. Isn't, uh, you put that very delicately, Mr. Rajan, but isn't the, <laughs> the sort of simple and brutal truth about this that in America, and of course you now sit in America, you've been a senior uh, economist at the IMF, in America you cannot afford to see the Chinese and the Indians scale back their economic aspirations. You need to see them consume and consume in ever greater numbers. Uh, absolutely. I mean, there is a question of when you do this, how you do this, and who adjusts. And, and clearly, with the world as a whole now suffering uh, from what looks like, you know, pretty much recessionary conditions, uh, the industrial world needs markets outside so as to grow again. And so clearly, this would not be the time to emphasize a dramatic reduction in consumption in Asian economies. The world depends more on them growing. But I think the sentiment that uh, over time, we need to move away from the emphasis of materialism, materialism so long as technologies don't adjust to allow them, uh, I think is a reasonable one that, that, that envi the environment is getting damaged and we have to worry about those things. Well, we'll talk plenty about the environment, but let's just stick with technology for a moment because Chandra Nair, in your formulation, which you've already outlined to me uh, about the restrictions that, that resources more than anything else place upon Asia, aren't you forgetting the, the resilience of, for example, 
Chinese uh, technologists. I mean, they have invested massive amounts in renewable energy. They are building, I believe, right now more than 100 new nuclear power plants. So when you say there are these clear, obvious resource constraints on China, maybe you're underestimating the Chinese. No, I'm not underestimating anyone. I think technology has, uh, has a role to play, and I suppose the the, the areas where I disagree with Dr. Rajan is firstly, I don't think the American political system uh, will adjust in the time frames that are, that are needed to, to deal with the issues, and climate change is just one of those issues on a global level. The second point is I don't think techn technology is the panacea for the issues we're talking about here. And that again is part of the, the, the rhetoric that has dominated the space. So instead of talking about the need for us to live within constraints. And I think it's very important that those of us who talk about constraints and, re and restraining are not seen as people who don't understand the world. I want to put it out there that we understand it's those who have continued to pursue this argument that there are no limits and technological fixes, free markets and finance will solve the problems are the ones who need to be challenged. Because yeah, if you look at it, many technologies have actually aided and abated the stripping of natural resources beyond anyone's imaginations and creating very unequitable uh, situations. But I'll tell you uh, what strikes me. The thing that you may not understand, ironically, is the Asian psyche. You're an Asian, you're born in Malaysia of Indian parentage, but it seems to me you underestimate the, the question of of, of justice that is felt by Asians here. Think of the Copenhagen Climate Summit. Yes. Many Chinese delegates and others said, how dare the West tell us that we have to sign sure. on to mandatory sure. caps on our emissions sure. when the historical emissions of the West are the fundamental problem at issue here and it is they who have to act, not us. This is a justice issue and you haven't mentioned and justice at all. we need to move all. well beyond that. We need to move well beyond the blame game. We are where we are in history. Do you think most Asians are ready to do that? Are most Asians ready to uh, say, okay, I, I accept that I can't have a motor car. I can't have that big I don't think a car ownership is a human right. And, and the point we're talking here about is where's the political leadership and what does the world look like? I mean, just to take cars, for example. If car ownership levels in Asia uh, start to match what is it in the OECD levels, OECD levels, we will have by 2050 something like 3 billion uh, passenger cars in the world, of but which Carlos, 2 billion... Carlos Ghosn, the, the, the boss yes, of yes. Renault-Nissan, says that that is precisely why he's confident about and his what business would you plan. Well, what would he, you he expect him to, to say? Of course, you can't ask Pizza Hut to sell less pizzas. So Carlos Ghosn wants to sell more cars. The reality is, most of our cities already dumps because of too many cars. We cannot, and, and all the fuel and energy needed to drive those cars is just simply not possible. What we have instead is the rhetoric of green cars and all, this is pure fiction. This will not happen. Take Germany. But, but let, 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 let's this go cannot back. happen. Uh, let, let's bring Mr. Rajan in. Sure. Yes. Go on, yeah, Raghu yeah, Rajan. Just going, back, just going back to the issue of justice, uh, just staying on that for a moment, uh, the, uh, the Indian Prime Minister said that uh, he's prepared to uh, live with a limit on caps. Uh, which is that Asia or India uh, will not consume more per capita of energy than does uh, the United States. Now, uh, that seems fair, um, but as you said, that will probably be unsustainable at this point. But that does put the ball back in the West court and says, you know, you've got to participate in this and bring down your per capita energy consumption. You can't depend on us to do all the adjustment. What's wrong with that? But, but, but in the meantime, and let's put this on you now, there, yeah, there you sit as, a, as an esteemed advisor to Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, Singh in India. You're a free marketeer. You're presumably telling him to c continue to adopt economic policies which deliver 7 8% growth per year. You continue to encourage him to uh, build new power stations, most of them coal-fired, emitting extraordinary amounts of greenhouse gases. I mean, you have to take a responsibility at some no. point for saying that your own economic message isn't sustainable. No, but uh, as Mr. Chan and I pointed out, uh, the effects of pollution are felt within the country itself. I mean, Indian cities are crumbling. Uh, there's not enough sewerage, there's too much pollution. Uh, there's no intent to go along this path forever. I mean, there is uh, a lot of talk about pollution, how that has to be curbed. There's a lot of talk about uh, taxes. Uh, there's a lot of talk about moving towards green and sustainable energy. Perhaps not as much 
uh, you know, as, uh, as the West would want, but it is, uh, the, the talk is growing. And this is why I think it should be a shared uh, sacrifice in some sense, rather than all the burden put on Asia to adjust. Yeah, I just wonder what you make of, of this. I'm going to quote you something that Chandran Nair has written, uh, and it seems to me it may have a direct relevance to you, Mr. Rajan, so let's go for it. Here it is. Too many Asians, he writes, are going to U.S. business schools and taking on an ideology all about free markets and capitalism, not talking about environmental limits and sustainability. Too few West-driven assumptions uh, are, are, excuse me, let me get the quote quite right, but there, he says these people, these Asians who go to America to study are smart, they're very smart, but they're intellectually neutered because they are aiming for a high-flying career in a multinational institution or corporation. Sounds like he's actually writing about you. No, not really, but... <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, you know, uh, I, I don't aspire to a career in a high-flying multinational corporation, but, but I, I think he, the point that he's making uh, is that there is an ideology of, uh, as you said, emphasizing growth uh, without taking into account environmental consequences. And I think that's wrong. I do think that uh, any economist worth his salt thinks about externalities and the fact that some of these externalities are unpriced. We have to find ways of pricing them. So, for example, when we talk about the costs of pollution, uh, many economists would say one way to deal with it is to have a high energy tax. That's not micromanaging the process by which people adjust, but making them face up to the cost of adjustment so that the best technologies emerge to deal with the adjustment. In other words, you're, you're, you're not making decisions for the, uh, for the firms and for people, but you're forcing them to think about it. And I think that's completely consistent with all the, uh, the theory that has been developed in capitalist economies. Uh, you know, some of the least polluted oh. cities in the world are in capitalist economies. Well, Chandra Naya, what I hear there from Mr. Rajan is, a, is an effort to define a, a middle ground, still embracing free market ideology, but tempering it with you know, some new adaptations and controls to accept some of your points about sustainability. Do you buy that as a viable I mean, third I, way? I teach at a business school. Uh, I work with some of the largest companies in the world. I haven't come to the, the point I am at the moment with the views that I've expressed in my book uh, through, you know, sort of an NGO activism sort of um, a way of thinking. I've seen the front end of where this happens. The problem is, and uh, Dr. Rajan is absolutely right, we should start to price externalities probably. None yeah, of this put is... Put a, none, a, a real price on yeah, carbon, for example. Well, carbon is just one, one part of externalities, and you can price yeah, but carbon. but let's not use the jargon. Let's, let's be clear about let's, this for our audience around the world. You, you, for example, do believe that carbon taxes have to be much, much higher. Much higher, but I also think... Uh, I'm, I'm, I, I come from my, my basic training is in pollution engineering, and one of the first things you learn about pollution engineering is you start to stop things at, before it gets into the pipe. So, you know, tr tr treating the symptoms, which is what uh, the economic instruments or emissions trading, etc., doesn't really deal with the need to reduce emissions. And this is why I talk about the political nature of our challenge in the 21st uh, century. We have to constrain further. things. Yeah, you do. You and you need strong government, well, which flies in the face of... What you seem to think we need is authoritarian government. No, I don't say authoritarian. I say we do need strong governments. If you look at what's happening in the U.S., uh, President Obama, with all the goodwill in the world, has not been able to do anything about carbon. And when I speak in the U.S. about the, the nature of uh, the, the, the climate change issues, etc., and, you know, the earnest people who come and listen, and I start talking about them taking action, and perhaps the need for, you know, slightly playing on the one-child policy, the one-car policy, they, they, so, they so all well, can't... No, 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 no. But you have to have about it. You're saying then government should intrude Absolutely. in people's lives, they should restrict the Absolutely. amount of cars they can own, Absolutely. maybe whether they can own a car at all. Absolutely. They should restrict uh, the access to meat, for example, because you're very they should price it. They should price it properly, at least. Well, yeah, but you'd probably go further in the end, wouldn't you? If meat, if meat was still being consumed in a way that you felt was unsustainable... No, you not at all. I, I, I have no qualms about people consuming meat. But consuming meat, which is the most unproductive... Uh, meat is one of the most uh, uh, unproductive uh, ways of creating food. Uh, well, let's price it properly. You know, it's water-intensive, it's carbon-intensive. And, you know, there are economists, and maybe Dr. Rajan should have a few PhDs done, and what would be a true price of a Mac burger? The suggestion but, is, but I the, argue, the, it would be the worth problem, 100 bucks. Uh, the, the problem, however, if uh, once you start going...